Hello everybody, my name is Iman and Essidi. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. Today we're going to cover chapter 2 of the David Klein Organic Chemistry textbook. In this session, we're going to discuss three main topics. In our discussion of how to efficiently draw molecules and compounds, we will come across different drawing styles. But why does bond line trump other drawing styles. And here we're going to learn what bond line is and how to read and write in bond line. Bond line structures uh, is a faster way to draw and an easier way to interpret. And we will be observing and working with molecules drawn using only in bond line starting now and for the rest of organic chemistry. We will also talk a little bit about constitutional isomers here. After, we're going to define and learn about some important functional groups. Functional groups are a characteristic group that has a predictable, predictable chemical behavior. And this is important because the chemistry of every organic compound is actually determined by the functional groups present in the compound. And lastly, in this chapter, we're gonna talk about resonance structures. Although bond line is the superior drawing style, it is inadequate in some situations and an approach called resonance is required to provide a more accurate representation of a molecule. Here we're going to learn what kinds of molecules will have resonance structures and how to draw and understand them. We're going to identify and draw resonance structures by learning the five patterns and then identifying the most important resonance structure. And that's pretty much going to be the three main topics of this chapter. But in this session, we're going to start off with molecular representation bond line structures and functional groups and the purpose of this specific session is to express the efficiency of bond line structures over other styles with bond line it's going to be easier to identify present functional groups and their locations and remember functional groups play a significant role in directing and controlling organic reactions now before bond line before bond line chemists use many different styles to draw molecules right we have lewis structure which we worked with in chapter one where all the bonds and atoms are shown maybe even lone pairs um, are drawn explicitly here um, and we did a couple of problems for learning how to draw lewis structures and everything is pretty much explicit in the lewis structure representation now in the partially condensed structure representation your carbon hydrogen bronze are not all drawn uh, this is very common in biochemistry when you're drawing sugars, for example. In your condensed structure, you have uh, here single bonds are not drawn. So it's more like a sentence than anything else. Um, kind of like reading what groups are where and how many of them, but not really seeing any of the bonds explicitly. And then your mo molecular formula is just going to tell you the number of each type of atom. And that is pretty much it. None of these are as efficient or clear, especially especially when you get to really big molecules, which is why we use bond line instead, because look at these two big molecules, for example. F uh, FAD stands for uh, flavine adenine dinucleotide. It's a, it's a redox activated coenzyme that's associated with some proteins. And look how massive this, this um, molecule is can you imagine drawing this in lewis structure where you show every atom every bond every lone pair explicitly it'd be quite a mess and here taxol that's another very big um, um molecule this is an anti-cancer chemotherapy drug and it pretty much blocks cancer cell growth by inhibiting cell division this would also be very messy if we were to draw these molecules out explicitly with every carbon and hydrogen and every lone pair and all the bonds very explicitly shown, it would be inefficient. So bond line is the way to go because it's a zigzag format where corners and endpoints now represent carbons. So instead of explicitly writing C for carbon everywhere that it appears, which is a lot in organic compounds, by the way, now we have this zigzag format where whenever you see an endpoint or a carbon, it is implied that that is a, a carbon atom. All right, hydrogens are also never drawn here when they are attached to carbon, they are implied. So, what that means is if a carbon has no charge, it's neutral, then you got to remind yourself well, hey, carbon can form four bonds. 
How many bonds do I see to this carbon? Oh, there's two. Well, then the other two bonds to this carbon must be implied hydrogens. I mean, let's look at this example. Let's look at this example right here. All right. This is a molecule where every end point and every corner here is a carbon. All right. It's implied within the bond line structure. All those blue tots are endpoints or corners and they imply hydrogens. Now let's look at this position one. All right. Here's this position one. This is that carbon right there. All right. It's attached to another carbon as we can see right here. All right. That's clear. We can clearly see that there's one bond to that carbon. Well, this carbon has no charge. It's neutral. So where are its other bonds, right? Because carbon forms four. Well, then if you only see one and the carbon is neutral, then the other three bonds to this carbon must be implied hydrogens that we don't draw out explicitly in bond line, but they're there. And that's the way you kind of lo logically work your way through understanding how many hydrogens are each at each of these carbon atoms, right? Let's look at position two now. Also a neutral carbon, by the way. All right, it's this purple one right here. It's explicitly attached to two other carbons here, all right? So we can very see, clearly see that it's there's two other carbons here. Well, remember, carbon forms four bonds. It's obviously a neutral carbon, so that's a correct assumption. That means that the other two bonds to this carbon are implied hydrogens. Let's look at position three. All right, that carbon clearly is bonded to three carbons, other three other carbons. That means the fourth bond to that carbon must be an implied hydrogen. So that's how we pretty much reason our way there, there, that's how we reason our way to understanding how many hydrogens are at each carbon. All right. Now, what if a carbon has a charge, positive or neg negative? How do I figure out the implied hydrogens then? All right. Well, let's look at an example and work our way like that. All right. Here's the example we just worked through. All right. One, two, three. All right. I've copied them here. Now, let's look at this a molecule now. Now some of these carbons have charges. Let's look at position one. Here's that carbon right there. It's attached to this other carbon. All right, cool, cool, cool. It has one bond, but it has a negative charge. All right, that carbon has a negative charge. Whenever a carbon has a negative charge, what you need to remember is that carbon's going to have three. Whenever that carbon has a negative charge, that carbon's going to have three bonds and one lone pair. Why is that the case? Well, remember, a neutral carbon has four valence electrons. That means it's going to try to bind to four other things, right? Because eight minus four, which is the number of valence electrons, gives you the number of bonds that carbon atom can form. Four. Now, if a carbon has a negative charge, that means that carbon has five electrons in its valence shell. So how many bonds can it form? It can form three bonds. It'll form three bonds and then it'll have a lone pair that's just there. So if this carbon atom right here has a negative charge and we see that it has explicitly one other bond to a carbon, then what we can assume is that it has two bonds to hydrogens. There's two implied hydrogens there and a lone pair that we don't see. So that's how we want to draw it. A carbon with a negative charge is going to have three bonds and a lone pair. Now, what about a carbon with a positive charge? Like this carbon two right here. It's clearly bonded to two other carbons. Okay, now let's remember a carbon with a positive charge lost an electron. So that means that carbon has only three valence electrons. All right. That means it's going to form three bonds with those three valence electrons. All right. And so we see two bonds explicitly. All right. That means that the third bond must be an implied hydrogen. So that's how we're going to work our way through 
uh, problems where atoms in bond lines, especially carbons, have a positive or negative charge. This is how we reason through how many implied hydrogens are there. And with practice, you're going to get really acquainted with this, and it'll be very quick. You don't, you no longer need to uh, work through all the steps to know, oh, well, when a carbon atom has a positive charge and it's bonded to one thing, then, oh, the other two are implied hydrogens. It'll become very natural. And we're also going to go uh, a little bit further on here. We're going to look at tables where uh, we look at oxygen atoms, positive charge, negative charge, and neutral, and what those look like in terms of bonding preferences for nitrogen, and then we're going to make one for carbon. So we're going to have three tables with what atoms look like if they're neutral, positive, or negative in terms of bonding preferences. Here in a little bit, we're going to get to that. But in conclusion, for bond line, all right, in bond line structures, carbons are implied. Every corner and end point is assumed to represent a carbon. Hydrogens are also implied. Carbon is assumed to possess enough hydrogen to fill its octet. In bond line, lone pairs are also implied. Heteroatoms are assumed to possess enough electrons to fill their octets. And formal charges are used to indicate when an atom does not satisfy its bonding preference. Also, just quickly, a couple more rules for bond line that I didn't write here that we're going to do together now. All right. You can technically draw single bonds how you like. And let me show you what, the, what I mean. All right, if you have four carbons like this, zigzag, here's one, two, three, four. All right, you can also draw it in its rotated form if you were to, like, rotate one of those bonds. Here's still four carbons, nothing else, just four carbons, and they're all single bonds, so you can rotate single bonds, right? These are absolutely equivalent all right there's nothing different about here we simply rotated around this axis and drew it this way but still there's just four carbons and that's pretty much it all right also triple bonds are drawn linear linear linearly sorry can't pronounce that triple bonds are drawn linearly all right so whenever you see a triple bond all right you got to draw it linearly and then any Corners and endpoints can be drawn. Double bonds, you don't have to do that. So you can draw double bonds like this. But with triple bonds, the before and after have to be straight and they all have to be pretty linear. That's how you appropriately draw that. All right. Now, third thing that also to keep in mind whenever you're drawing ketones or aldehydes or stuff like that, which is whenever you're attaching, when there's a, a double bond oxygen, say, uh, which way, which way is the best way to draw it? Or which way is the correct way to draw it? A or B? Well, obviously, A, you want the additional group that's coming off of your carbon chain to be drawn the furthest away from all the other atoms as possible. So this is way too close. These are colliding here with the carbons. You want it out and about. So you, that's how you draw that appropriately. Um, and then whenever there are atoms besides carbon, the hydrogens are going to be explicitly written. So if you have like a, 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 a an alcohol group here at the end, right, with the oxygen, that hydrogen is going to be written there. So don't worry. You're not going to have to, um, you know, assume that there's a hydrogen there or, or not. For heteroatoms, hydrogens are not implied. They will be explicit, which is really nice. All right. So those are all really important things to keep in mind in regards to bond line. Now, um, I want to elaborate here on this point. All right, rule number four. All right, formal charges are used to indicate when an atom does not satisfy its bonding preference. All right, and this is going to go back to our minimal discussion here about, okay, what if, what if atoms have charges on them? All right. What if atoms have charges on them? What are their bonding preferences then? Well, we have a few a few tables here to really help us understand that. All right. So formal charges on an oxygen atom associated with a particular number of bonds and lone pairs. So if we have an oxygen atom, all right, and it's neutral, no charge, how how its bonding its bonding preferences are going to be two bonds and two lone pairs. All right, so an oxygen, if you see an oxygen 
in bond line like this, all right, no charge, that means its bonding preference is to form two bonds and have two lone pairs. And here are several examples of where oxygens are neutral. All right, in both of these cases, their bonding preferences are two bonds. And then it's implied that the two lone pairs are there, but they're not going to be explicitly drawn. That's why it's good to know that a neutral oxygen's bonding preference is to have two bonds and two lone pairs. That's how it's, that's how it's going to be. All right. Now, what if an oxygen atom has a negative charge? All right. Well, an oxygen with a negative charge bonding preference is to form one bond and have three lone pairs. So whenever you see, whenever you see an oxygen with a negative charge, know that there are about that that there are three lone pairs sitting on that oxygen. It's not going to be explicitly drawn for you. That's why you need to know this. All right, here's another oxygen with a negative charge. There are three lone pairs associated with that, and obviously it's only bonded, it, there's only one bond to the oxygen. Now, an oxygen with a positive charge, okay, is going to form three bonds and have one lone pair. So here's an example. Here's an oxygen bonded to three things, and there is a lone pair there that is implied but will not be drawn. All right, and it's the same for these two, these two cases as well. All right, so an oxygen with no charge is going to form two bonds and have two lone pairs. An oxygen with a negative charge will form one bond and have three lone pairs. And an oxygen with a positive charge will have three bonds and one lone pair. Now, what about nitrogen? All right, what about nitrogen? Well, a neutral nitrogen will form three bonds and have one lone pair. So we see here, this is a neutral nitrogen. It forms two bonds to two hydrogens and then one to carbon, and then it will have one lone pair there that's implied. And you can see it properly drawn out like this where everything is shown. Of course, in bond line, it will always look like this, all right? But this is what's implied, all right? Now, a nitrogen with a negative charge is going to form two bonds and have two lone pairs. For example, look at this nitrogen two bonds, but there's also two lone pairs there that are implied. Okay, that's good to know. Now, a nitrogen with a positive charge is going to just form four bonds, and it will have no lone pairs. So here's a good example. Here's a nitrogen with four bonds, all right? A, a nitrogen with a positive charge is going to have those four bonds. There are no lone pairs there, okay? No lone pairs. Now, these two tables you can find in the David Klein textbook. All right, but let's make one for carbon, right? There's there's not a table for carbon, so we're going to make one together now, all right? What does a carbon with no charge look like? Well, a carbon with no charge is going to form four bonds and have no lone pairs like so. Here's a carbon, and here's its four bonds. Carbon and its four bonds. Carbon and its four bonds. It's neutral. There are no lone pairs. Now, a negative carbon, and we we just talked about this, it's going to form three bonds and it's going to have one lone pair. So a negative carbon is going to form three bonds and it's going to have one lone pair. All right. Now, what about a positive carbon? What is that going to look like? Well, a, a carbon with a positive charge is only going to form three bonds and it's going to have no lone pairs. So look at this carbon with a positive charge only has three bonds. This carbon with a positive charge also only three bonds. And same here. So these are all good things to keep in mind because right now bond line is very new to you, right? So sometimes looking at bond line structures, you're not you're not acclimated to know quickly how many implied hydrogens there are or where the lone pairs are implied and so on and so forth. But understanding and taking some time to understand what oxygen looks like, neutral. Uh, you know, cation and anion and same for nitrogen and same for carbon is really going to help you get used to being faster at looking at bond line and knowing exactly what's going on there. All right. Of course, we can do some practice problems now. All right. So here, this practice problem asks, how many implied hydrogens does each labeled carbon have? So we're going to come here. We're going to look at this first carbon. All right. It's bonded to one thing, one other carbon right here. Okay, it's neutral. That means that the three other bonds that that carbon has are implied hydrogens. 
All right, now let's look at this carbon over here. All right, it's clearly bonded to one, two, three other things. It's neutral. What that means is that the fourth bond to this carbon is an implied hydrogen. All right, and now let's look at this last carbon. It has, it has one, two, three bonds. It's neutral. That fourth bond is an implied hydrogen. All right, let's do this problem here too. All right, here's our first carbon. It has one, two, three bonds. It's neutral, and so that fourth bond must be an implied hydrogen that's not drawn out for us. All right, let's look at this carbon right here. It has, and let's do a different color, one, two, three, four bonds. It already has its four bonds. It's neutral. It's all good. We don't need to draw. There's no hydrogens attached to that carbon. All right, let's look at this carbon right here. It has, it has one, two bonds that we explicitly see. It's neutral. That means that the other two bonds this carbon has are implied hydrogens. They're there, but we can't see them. All right, and what about this last carbon? It has one, let's do a different color. There's one, two, three, four bonds. That carbon already has all four of its bond. There are no hydrogens there. So that's kind of sort of the thing that um, you want to do and practice with just so you can get used to bond line structures a little more and understand the number of implied hydrogens at every position much, much uh, uh, faster. Now let's convert each structure here into bond line. Okay, so we're given like a line structure here. Let's draw the bond line structure for each one of these, all right? So here, so what we wanna do, the kind of technique we want is find our carbon chain and then go ahead and draw that out in bond line. So here we have just a two carbon chain and every all the hydrogens, remember, in bond line are implied, so we're just gonna draw our two carbons in bond line. And that's pretty much what it would look like, a straight line, right? Each of these corners or endpoints are implied hydrogens, and that's all there is here. All right, now what about this, this second problem here? We have our carbons. They form a ring, so we're just going to go ahead and draw them as such. We'll draw it as a ring. Some of these have double bonds. Make sure that you're drawing the double bonds appropriately. And remember, we don't draw the hydrogens. So that's pretty much it. That's what that would look like. Now for this last one, here is all our hetero, here's all our carbons and some hetero atoms in there, right? We, we want to write those out, okay? So now we want to go ahead and draw that in bond line. And what we want to remember here is, oh, there's a hetero atom right there. We want to we wanna write that out explicitly. And also, for each hetero atom, you actually want to write out the hydrogens that are bonded to this. So this is going to be NH2 right here. All right, here's a carbon that's not pretty. Let's make that a little bit better. All right, here's that other carbon, fourth carbon, boom, right? Because we have one, two, three, four, and a nitrogen. And here's our nitrogen, one, two, three, four carbons, beautiful. And right here, we have this double bond to oxygen, and that oxygen has a hydrogen, so we want to draw that out. Awesome. Now, do we need to um, attach any formal charges to any of these hetero atoms here all right or any of the carbons for that sake well all the carbons have four bonds now this nitrogen this nitrogen is bonded to four things all right it has four bonds and we know nitrogens with four bonds all right it's going to have a positive charge four bonds and probably no lone, lone pairs here it's going to have a positive charge this oxygen it has three bonds, all right? Now, an oxygen with three bonds, if we just go back to our table, all right? Oxygens with three bonds usually are going to come with one lone pair, and they're going to have a positive charge, all right? So we use these tables to reaffirm that. Remember, also nitrogen, when it has four bonds, usually it's going to have no lone pairs and a positive charge. So that's how we're figuring that out. All right, so this oxygen, three bonds, there's probably a lone pair there. All right, we're not going to draw it out explicitly, but I'm just letting you know. We're going to attach a positive charge to this oxygen. All right, fantastic. Now, 
I'm going to leave these for you to do and I will have the answers posted along with these notes but you go ahead and try to figure out a B and C here and convert them to bond line and if and, and attach appropriate formal charges if need be now let's talk let's talk about functional groups this is the last topic for our session today okay functional groups are really important because actually before we get to functional groups let's talk about constitutional isomers really quickly since we've talked about bond line now constitutional isomers now this is a topic that is actually in your book uh in the david klein book constitutional isomers is talked about in chapter one actually but i always like to talk about it after we've covered bond line because i think it's a lot easier to understand when you can start to um, draw your molecules using bond line as opposed to your Lewis structure. If you're trying to do constitutional isomers by drawing out Lewis structures, sometimes it can get a little bit confusing. But constitutional isomers are essentially molecules that have identical, identical molecular formulas. All right, that means they have the same number of atoms of each kind, but different connectivity. All right, so constitutional isomers have identical molecular formulas, but different connectivity. Constitutional isomers have different physical properties and even different names. So let's do an example where we're asked to draw the constitutional isomer for C3, H7Cl. All right, so there are several structures that are going to have this exact molecular formula, but they're going to look different. They're going to have different connectivity and be completely different molecules. So how are we going to draw all the constitutional isomers for this molecular formula? Well, we're going to develop a method for doing this kind of problem. Our first step is to start off with the carbon chain being the length of the number of carbons you have in your molecular formula. So if we have C3 in our molecular formula, we're going to start off by drawing C3, a carbon of three, uh, a carbon chain of three. In bond line. All right. So three carbons, one, two, three. All right. Here we have one, two, three three carbons. All right, that's our first step. Since we have three carbons in our molecular formula, we're going to start off by drawing three carbons. Now, next thing we want to figure out, step two, is how many bonds can each atom form? All right, how many bonds can each atom form? All right, so we have carbon here. Carbon forms four bonds. Hydrogen forms one, and chlorine also forms one bond. All right, so knowing that, we can move into our third step here, where we pretty much play with a combination of this information. All right, we're going to play with it. So we have our three carbon chain, and we know that carbon forms four bonds. All right, and hydrogen forms one and chlorine forms one. And we have three hydrogen, we have three carbons, we have seven hydrogens, and we have one chlorine. All right, so we start off with our three carbon chain. Okay, what if we attach our chlorine here? All right, and then that means that means our hydrogens are our hydrogens would be here. One, two, one. Now, does this work? We're just playing around here, right? So I had a three carbon chain. I went ahead and just attached chlorine all the way at the end. And I wanted to check if with the chlorine at the end and putting all the hydrogens appropriately, does this work? Well, let's see. Let's count how many hydrogens. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yes, we have all seven hydrogens. Check. We have one chlorine. Check. And we have three carbons. Sorry, three carbons. Check. This has all the atoms it needs. This is perfect. So this is a 
constitutional isomer of C3H7Cl. Uh, All right, so here's one. This is number one. Beautiful. Now, maybe you are tempted. All right, let's try again. Let's see if we could come up with something different. Maybe you're tempted to attach this on the opposite side. All right. Well, this is a good thing to know that these two are actually exactly the same. All you're doing it is technically rotating it and putting it on the opposite side. It is not any different. And if you're confused as to why it's not any different, whenever we get to actually naming molecules, all right, learning how we name molecules, you're going to realize that these both are going to end up with the same name because they're actually the same exact molecules. It's simply just a rotation of each other. They're just rotated versions of each other. Okay, so they're not any different. Okay, and we're just trying, we're actually trying to draw all the constitutional isomers, all the unique constitutional isomers for C3H7Cl. All right, so let's try again. Maybe there's, maybe there's a different combination. So we're going to draw out our three carbon chain. All right, let me see. What if I attach the chlorine here in the middle? Would this work? Well, let me put my hydrogens and see if it works. There's going to be three here. To satisfy the carbon having four bonds, three here and one here. Let's count now. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven hydrogens. Check. There's one chlorine. Check. And there's three carbons. Check. This is. Ooh, why am I using a highlighter? This is another constitutional isomer. Yay. This is number two. Perfect. Awesome. Now that's pretty much, that's actually going to be pretty much it for that. With our three carbon chain, those are the only two unique constitutional isomers that we get. Okay, but then there's a fourth step, all right? So the fourth step is, we're going to do that right here. Sorry, there's no room. All right, we started off with a carbon chain, the length of how many carbons we had. So we had three carbons, so we drew a three carbon chain. Now to make sure that we really have gotten all the constitutional isomers, all right, now we're going to draw a carbon chain that's one less than what we had. So now we're going to do a two carbon chain. All right, one, two, and start playing with that. All right, so if we have a carbon here, carbon here, what if we attach a chlorine and then add our another carbon? Does this work? Is this another constitutional isomer? There's three carbons. Well, no, your chlorine, remember, can only have one bond. Okay, so this can't be another constitutional isomer, all right? And any way you try to play this, all right, you'll realize that it's not possible to, to use a two-carbon chain and attach anything anywhere here and make a new constitutional isomer. Therefore, we have for C3H7Cl, we have two unique constitutional isomers. Now, this method of doing one less carbon chain is going to be a lot more useful Whenever you have, say, like six carbons in your molecular formula, then you start off with a six carbon chain. All right. And try to play around with whatever other atoms you have. And then you'll do one less. You'll do a five carbon chain and see if you can get any other unique structures. And you'll just keep going down until you draw all the constitutional isomers you possibly can for a molecule. But this only has three carbons, so there's not much room to play or get creative here. But this is a good step by step to kind of do that and if you feel like you still don't get constitutional isomers or you have specific questions let me know and i can always always do more problems if need be all right now we can get to our final topic of this session and that is functional groups on to functional groups remember the chemistry of every organic compound okay the chemistry of every organic compound is determined by the functional groups present in the compound. Therefore, the classification of organic compounds is based on their functional groups. And here what you see is a lot of a list of functional groups that you probably need to know. All right. For most classes, I would assume that these are things that you need to memorize and will not be given to you. All right. If you don't, then you are so lucky. But it is really good to know the names of these functional groups and, and, and know how to draw them and understand them and have them memorized, all right? Uh, you have here alkyl halides, all right? That's whenever you have a, um, a, a halogen 
in your molecule. They're called alkyl halides. All right, carbon double bonds are called alkenes. Carbon triple bonds are called alkynes. Carbon single bonds, by the way, are called alkanes with an A. All right, so you have alkanes, alkenes, and alkynes. All right, then you have OH, that's an alcohol group. All right, an oxygen in between two groups. R means just a variable group, by the way. R is a variable group. It can be anything. All right, it's just arbitrary. An oxygen between two variable groups is called an ether. All right, SH groups are called thiol. S between two variable calls is a sulfide. All right, here's your aromatic ring or benzene. All right, a carbon oxygen double bond, and then there's two variable groups on each side is ketone. Carbon oxygen double bond with only one variable group and another hydrogen is called aldehyde. All right, this is a carboxylic acid. This is an acyl halide, right? You have a halogen, but it's right next to a carbon double bonded to an oxygen. An anhydride here is this structure right here. Then an ester is a, is a OR group next to a carbonyl, which is this carbon double bonded to an oxygen. Here's an amide and an amine. Now, a cool way that I uh, learned some of these, right, besides just looking at them, um, is this. So, very easy for carbon single bonds, alkanes, carbon double bonds, alkenes, carbon triple bonds, alkynes, all right, A-E-Y. Um, for the other groups, I had this cool way of, of, of uh, learning them, all right? So, an alcohol, all right, is a oxygen-hydrogen OH group attached to something else, any variable group, right? It can be anything. Cool. Now, if you add a carbon double oxygen, double bonded to an oxygen. By the way, this is called a carbonyl. It's not a functional group by, on its own, but it's a common uh, kind of signature that you see in a lot of uh, uh, functional groups. So if you take this alcohol group and you slather on a carbonyl, what you get is another functional group, all right? That's called a carboxylic acid. All right, so this is an alcohol right here. All right, if you sandwich a carbonyl right next to it, now you have another functional group called carboxylic acid. All right, cool. Let's do kind of the same thing with something else. All right, here's an, an ether. is an oxygen sandwiched between two variable groups. What if I added a carbonyl to this one? All right, I get another. This gives me a different functional group called an ether, all right? So that's another way to memorize these two kinds of functional groups, ether, uh, sorry, not an ether, this is an ester. Oops, this is an ester, my bad. All right, so an ether, you add on a carbonyl group, you get an ester, all right? Cool, cool, cool. And another a better way to draw this so you, you remember, right? It's the same thing, except now there's a carbonyl. And there's one more, all right? Now, this is an, an amine, all right? It's an, or an amine. I've heard both pronunciations. I don't know which one is more correct, if either is at all. Here's an uh, amine, all right? It's nitrogen with three different variable groups. Now, what if I go ahead and add that carbonyl? we get an amide. So this is just a fun way for me to, this was a fun way for me to remember my functional groups, you know. Um, oh, I remembered what an alcohol is. And because I remember what an alcohol is, I can just add right here a carbonyl and boom, I get another functional group that's easy to remember, carboxylic acid. I remembered what an ether is. It's like an O sandwich between two variable groups and it kind of looks like a shoulder, like shrugging, like ether or kind of thing. Okay, slather on a carbonyl group, you get a different functional group. It's called an ester. And that was an easy way for me to remember ester and ethers. All right, here's an amine nitrogen with three variable groups. If I slather on a carbonyl, oh, look, that gives me a different functional group called amide. And that was an easy way for me to remember amines and amides. And so um, that was just like a quick way for me to memorize these quicker because it was important that I, I knew these functional groups. Um, as well as, you know, alkanes, al 
keynes alkynes, easy, A, E, Y, single, double, triple bonds. Um, also another easy one. Um, so these, this carbonyl group is really central to aldehydes and ketones. The only difference is a ketone has two variable groups on each side, so that's a ketone. All right, when you have a carbonyl and the two other groups on each side are not hydrogens, they're variable groups like car like carbon chains or whatever else, that's a ketone. But if one of the um, R groups, if there was only one R group and then the other side it was a hydrogen, then that is an aldehyde. So that's another way, fun way of remembering that as well. Um, other than that, it's just a matter of Maybe making flashcards or doing enough problems or, or reading or looking at molecules enough to kind of get accustomed and re to remembering all these functional groups. And you'll see some more often than other functional groups, but nevertheless, it's good to know all of these because you will be seeing them quite a lot starting now. Um, let me know if you have any questions about anything we've covered so far. Uh, Email me questions or leave them in the comments below. And if I get enough questions about this chapter or this section, I might do a problem set for this specifically, some more problems for us to do together. Other than that, I hope this was helpful and have a great day.